Greetings, friends. Grace and peace be to you in the name of our Lord Jesus. I'd like to talk today about the importance of right doctrine for Christian growth. Right doctrine is very important, um, but you know, you know, whenever you mention that word doctrine, people start thinking negative things. They start thinking, oh, that's the thing that causes division. Or, or they might think you're being doctrinally dogmatic, like just not being open to any other ideas, just sticking to whatever it is that you think, and that's it, you know. And so uh, I want to try to show to you that doctrine is important. We shouldn't be afraid of that word, because doctrine is spoken of over and over again in the Bible as being quite important. And so we're going to do a little Bible study here. And uh, now first of all, I want to look, to look at the fact that, that the word doctrine just simply means teachings. You know, you go to school to, to learn, you have a teacher. So that's not a negative thing, is it? So uh, teachings are good. A doctrinal system is referred to as a doctrine. So it's a, it's a group of teachings. And in the Bible, this uh, group of teachings is called our faith. It's called the faith. And uh, so that set of doctrines is the faith, and the, uh, the teachings refer to what we believe is the truth. And uh, when Pilate spoke to Jesus, he asked him, he asked him, what is truth? And the, the amazing thing is that he was face to face with the physical embodiment of truth. And that was our Lord Jesus, who is truth. And so, uh, and Jesus also said, I am the truth, isn't he? I am the truth, the way, and the life. So Jesus is truth. And uh, so uh, it says, the word of God spread, and the number of, of disciples uh, multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and, great, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So here we, were, we hear that, that the faith. And so what is the faith? Well, the faith is a set of doctrines that define what we believe. And it's also in Acts 14, 21, and 22. They preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith. So what you believe in the Bible, if you believe in the Bible in the New Testament, and have believed in Jesus Christ, then you have believed in the faith, which is a set of doctrinal teachings. Now the Bible says that the church is built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ and the holy apostles and prophets. It says this in Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. Now therefore you are no more, no more uh, strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having built, been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So... Uh, the apostles and the prophets here are the New Testament apostles that we know who they are, the twelve. And then the prophets like Paul, when he uh, broke up with Barnabas, he, he brought along him, uh, with him Silas. Silas was a prophet. It's not talking there about the Old Testament prophets. It's talking about New Testament prophets. Now, apostles and New Testament prophets had doctrinal authority in the church. So that's why it mentions... Apostles and prophets doesn't mention uh, 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 pastors or evangelists because they don't have doctrinal authority. And the reason that they were given doctrinal authority is because they walked with Jesus and Jesus personally taught them what his doctrine was. So um, I want to re uh, refer to the main doctrine of the Bible. Uh, that's uh, that that. Uh, is in Matthew 16, 13 through 16. So when Jesus, he was with the disciples and he asked them, who do men say that I am? You know, and they gave him different answers. And, and, and But Peter confessed, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. See, so this is the very foundational doctrine, says, of our whole faith. And, and Jesus said to him, you, you are Peter, which means a, a little stone, he says, but upon this rock, I will build my church. The church is built upon the teaching that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so that's 
you know, when Satan attacks the doctrine of the church, that's probably one of the first things he attacks, because that's the very foundation. And uh, so then, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's uh, look at Acts 2, 41 through 42. Then those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in fellowship, and in breaking the bread and prayers. So you see, the, in the early church, it was very important to get the, the doctrine set right. So the apostles went around teaching, and it says they went from house to house teaching. And that, that's because the houses had house churches in them. There were no tabernacles or churches you go to. But the, the churches met in homes. And the apostles were probably very busy. They were probably teaching every day, maybe several sermons a day. Like uh, John Wesley, they said he, he preached an average of three sermons a day for his, his, most of his ministry. So, you know, they weren't just sitting on their butt preaching one 20-minute sermon uh, once a week. You know, they were, they were uh, teaching the doctrine of Christ because it's very important for people to get that word. That word is very important, especially uh, baby Christians. And uh, so that's one of the things I, think I see as neglecting, being neglected in the church today. But uh, the other thing is the doctrine of Christ is primarily that we love one another. See, because this was the teaching of Jesus. And the, the, the teaching that we love one another will produce unity. So, you know, when they say that doctrine causes division, that's completely wrong if you have the right doctrine, see. The right doctrine is that we love one another as I have loved you, is what Jesus said. The new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. See, there's no greater testimony to the truth of the Bible than Christians being unified in love. And that's something that we really failed in because we're, we've divided upon all, all these different camps, these different denominations, and some believe in being baptized by sprinkling, some by immersion, and... You know, we have all these different doctrines that divide us, but what we haven't realized is the doctrine, the commandment of our Lord Jesus, in, in, is to love one another. So we must fulfill that. That doctrine is primary. First, the, the, the deity of Christ, that Christ is the Son of the living God, and then we obey His words and His commandments that we love one another. Um, John 15, 7, If you abide in me and my words in you, you'll ask what you desire, and it shall be given you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, I so also have I loved you. Um, if you abide in my love, and if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. For I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then we jump on over to, to second, the book of Second John, which is the letter of John, uh, verse 9 and 10. It says, Whosoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house or greet him. So what he's talking about there is the doctrine that we love one another. You know, if you read Paul's teaching in, in uh, Ephesians 3 and, and throughout his letters to the churches, uh, Philippians, um, Philippians 1 and 2, he, he, it's really important for him that the church be in unity. He's talking about the unity because unity is very important. But you can't have unity with hypocrites and false teachers. So that produces a problem, and that's what's that's why th there's so many fragments in the church today. Because usually when when the church backslid and became apostate to some degree, and starting with the Roman Church, and Martin Luther says, "Boy, I'll try to reform it," but he got to the point where he thought, "Well, I can't really reform it; it's too corrupt." So I'll have to just go out and start my own church. And, you know, Jesus did that too. He didn't try to join the synagogue. You know, it was so corrupt that he didn't take his disciples and say, okay, let's learn from these teachers. Well, this, he knew these guys were all hypocrites. So he separated himself from them. And sometimes that's necessary. You know, but, but at the same time, remember, the doctrine is unity. And sometimes we just divide over these things that are insignificant and don't really matter that much. And it really is a sin against our Lord Jesus when we don't have the unity and love for one another. You know, so, that, so let's remember that when we consider this. But in the book of Hebrews, Paul is, lists the fundamental milk doctrines. He calls them the milk doctrines. Um, but the advanced doctrine, you'll see, is 
teaching on holiness. It's not teaching on prophecy or you know the Greek you know you know definitions of words and stuff like that. Advanced teaching is teaching on practical holiness and how to you know uh, be more holy. But he calls that meat. So that you don't give that to babies, baby Christians. You know, the guy might come into your church and he has a problem with cigarettes. You don't say, "Hey, put down your cigarette right now, or you're not allowed in here." You know, you you, you teach him the basic fundamentals. So let's, let's see what Paul is talking about. He says, "There, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on unto perfection." So that's holiness, right? All right, okay. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith towards God, the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands. The resurrection and eternal judgment. So he, he gives us six six foundational teachings. And, you know, we could go into detail on each of these, but it would take a long time. I got some videos on repentance and faith and, and then and then also one on holiness so far up to this point. But um, but if you look back in chapter five, verse twelve to fourteen, he says, For for though at this time you ought to be teachers, you have need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. So that's what he was just listed there. He says, you have come to need milk, and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. You see, so, so the meat is the word of righteousness. For he is a babe, but solid food belongs to those who are full age, to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You see, so that's part of maturity. And if, you'll, you'll, if you've raised children, you, you, should have, you should know this principle, like when... When they're children, you tell them what to do, but you don't tell them, you know, when they're babies and little kids, you don't tell them why. You don't reason with them. But as they mature, you reason with them more and more. You develop their reasoning capacity so they can, you know, discern on their own good and evil. Because if, if they couldn't discern good and evil on their own, they're immature, you know. And a lot of times parents do that with their children. They keep them immature throughout life so they can control them. And, you know, and some, some preachers do that to people in church, too. I hate to say that, but it's true. Today, the church has a system of doctrine that's like the Pharisees. It produces, it produces hypocrisy. Um, let's read Matthew 16, 11 to 12. How is it that you do not understand that I do not speak to you concerning bread? Because so he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. They thought he was, I saw he was talking about bread. But to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees, you see. Because it produces hypocrisy. It produces outward righteousness, but not an inward heart righteousness, you see. And Luke 12, 1 through 3, In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together, so that they trampled one another, he began to say his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. See, so there it is. For there's nothing, no, nothing uh, covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. So everything that we have done in this life will be revealed. And so he's saying, yeah, they're not going to get away with it. Um, and then in uh, Galatians, Paul warned the church that false doctrine would cause envy and strife. See, the, the, the doctrine of the Judaizers and keeping the Jewish law was causing envy and strife. Now, have you ever been in church where that's happened, where people are fighting? You know, Paul talk, I mean, James talks about it, too. From whence come wars and fightings among you. He's exaggerating a little bit. They're not real wars, but the quarrels that people have sometimes are just like a little war going on. And, you know, it shouldn't be that way in the church. But I tell you, you know, if you're a non-believer and listen to this, and say, oh, those hypocrites are always fighting with each other. Really, the truth is, Christians really get along great to a large degree for any group of people that you put together. I've been in secular groups. I, I was once in a, a hiking group. And, you know, the, the people that are not Christians and not saved, they just, they, you know, they, it's amazing how much, you know, envy and strife there is in those groups. But, you know, sometimes this creeps into churches, too, and it's because of the carnality and spiritual immaturity. And so you may have suffered from that, and I apologize if you have, you know, I wasn't there, and I didn't participate in it, but I apologize on the behalf of the gospel of Christ. But you need to forgive those people if that's happened to you. Um, but he said, he says in Galatians 1, 6-9, he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, 
that would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven preaching any other gospel than that you have, um, which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And as we said before, so now I say again, if any man preach any other gospel than that which you have received, let him be accursed. So it's a major thing to Paul. When someone comes along and preaches a false doctrine, another gospel, you see, and I'm afraid that there's a lot of false doctrine in churches nowadays. And it produces the fruit of hypocrisy. It really does. Those, those two things go together. Um, and uh, he says, and then in Galatians 5, 7, and 9, he says, he says, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion does not come of him that calls you. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. So what leaven was, was it's yeast that's put into the bread. And then it per permeates through the whole thing. And when you have false teaching in a church, it affects the whole the whole church, and it just permeates through everything, and produces hypocrisy, and, um, and it's just the, the nature of it. And it's kind of like a poison, it, you know. You know, in bread, it's a good thing; it makes the bread soft and stuff like that. But uh, and in Galatians five fourteen to sixteen, he says, "For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself." Then he goes on, "But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one another, uh, one of another." It says, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So the problem is they weren't walking in the Spirit. They were in the carnal realm because they were paying attention to the carnal commandments of man. You know, keeping rules and regulations, that kind of thing. And, you know, we may not be, you know, having that in the church, maybe, but they may be teaching their own rules and regulations, you know, like, well, this is, this is holiness. So if you uh, don't go to movies, and you don't do this, and don't do that, then you're being holy. But not, not de describing the true holiness, which is love. If you love, you, you're producing the fruit of true holiness, you see. So um, there are many that are saying they're teaching, they're teaching the Bible and truth, but, you know, but they really aren't. Because you know, um, if, you, if you teach the Bible, you should live the Bible, right? Um, you know, well, what uh, causes division is hypocrites teaching the Bible in order to gain a following. You know, and you and you you get you get that kind of problem with churches too, and Paul warned about you know the Ephesian church about these wolves that would come in. He says, uh, twenty twenty eight through thirty he says, take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock among you which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this that after my departure, savage wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock, and from yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. So one way to tell a false teacher, you know, is he will glorify himself. See, no man who has really submitted himself to the cross of Jesus will glorify himself or be motivated by pride or selfish ambition. Men who are like that, run from them, they're wolves. Uh, he will exalt himself as something great and tend to brag in his sermons as something else will do. I've seen these guys do this, and, and it's really disguised, and the people think the guy's really being, you know, hear somebody talking about how humble they are? You know, that's bragging. You know, I'm bragging about how humble I am. I'm the humblest man in the world. You know, uh, Maybe other people can say that about you, and it may be real, but when you're saying it about yourself, there's something wrong, you know. So... And the other thing is they'll try to develop a following, a bunch of people following them. And that's usually because they want to control those people and get to their money. Um, now let's look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. This tells about how important doctrine is. There, uh, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for, uh, for doctrine. Oh, that's not a bad word, is it? It's for doctrine, it's good. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You see, that's what doctrine is for. Reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. And so that, how, why? So that the man of God may be perfect. That means complete or mature, fully grown up, yes, and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So here's the meat doctrine, you see, teaching us how to do, do good works. And not to just be passive Christians sitting in church and warming a pew, you know. And in, in John uh, 7, 16 through 18, Jesus answered in the same I said unto them, <clears throat> My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him, 
is true and no unrighteousness is in him. You see, so Jesus said, this is my doctrine, my doctrine, and it's a good thing. You know, and now that's what, you know, he didn't seek his own glory, but that's, that's what the false teachers will do. They'll seek, they seek their own glory, and sometimes they're very subtle about it by pretending to be humble. You know, so you got to have discernment to be able to discern this. Um, now, how do you tell if a church is preaching the true gospel? Well, you look at the lifestyle of the pastor and the people. If they're producing the fruits of holiness and love, it, it, it must be due to the truth that they're preaching. See, But if they are producing hypocrisy, it is evidence that a false gospel is being preached. You see? So, that's one way you can tell. And, um, you know, on this subject, I'm just going to throw this in right here. If you have a pastor that's not preaching the true gospel, you know, Paul said that person is cursed. He's, he's, he's preaching a false gospel. And, and, you know, you should either leave that church, or, you should, or if there's enough people that are the true sheep of God's people, then that person needs to be removed because he's t t taking the whole congregation astray and leading them to destruction. But see, um, you know, he talks about, uh, yeah, in Matthew 15, 7, let's read that. Yeah, Jesus said, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah the prophet speak of you, saying, This people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain do they worship me, teaching the do for doctrines the commandments of men. So, you know, you get these guys, that are, and one of the big doctrines they teach is, like, they really hammer you with the tithing thing. Man, that's that's the law. Like, you got to do this, because, you know, they're fundraising. But... Uh, you know, that's one of the commandments. They, and there can be lots of other commands. They just bring you, and you're like, okay, you have to do this, you have to do that. And anytime you know, someone is telling you to do that, and they're treating you like a baby, because, you know, you should be able to make your own decisions, right? And, um, and, and they're treating you like, you know, like an idiot. <laughs> and, and, and also, well, what they do is they worship in vain. They have these worship services, but it's all in vain because they're not... They're teaching the commandments of men, which are not the commandments of God. See, the commandment of God is love. Love from a pure heart. And so when you're doing that, then you're really fulfilling God's will in your life. But when you're just keeping rules and regulations and not having love, then you're missing the boat. So, um, and also true pastors will never be motivated by money in their preaching. Um, those who are, usually are, are preaching a false gospel in order to give the people what they want to hear. And the American Prosperity Gospel is a, is a good example of that. Let's look at Titus 1, 7 through 11. For, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. Not greedy for money, hear that? <laughs> but hospitable, lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. See, these guys were directly taught by the apostles. One of the areas of apostolic authority is the authority to, to appoint elders. So these guys were personally trained by the apostles so that they could teach the people the right doctrine. See, so they were passing on what they got from Jesus. That he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who are gainsayers or those who contradict in the New King James. Um, for there are many insubordinate uh, or both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. And so, you know, there you go. That's their motivation. Their motivation is money, and, and they're, gain, they're get, getting something out of it. You know, so, um, you know, it does say that you should support and pay your pastors. You know, that does say that the pastor is worthy of his hire. You know, but it, it, that's for a guy that's a true pastor, pe preaching, preaching the truth, and that one that really has the love of God in his heart and is a true shepherd. The false teachers, you know, um, you don't want to be giving them your money because they're going to be uh, preaching a, a false gospel that takes people to hell. So this, uh, <laughs> this preaching for dishonest gain this is something that we see going on a lot in the United States of America and on these tele, televangelist preachers. And I tell you folks, um, it's something you really got to have discernment on. And it's not just the guys that, the Word of Faith guys, it's them too. Yeah, they're out, they're, they're preaching this, you know, you know, getting their, you know, 
they're, 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 they're jets and, and fancy houses and all these other things. This guy's just take them all to hell. That's what it's going to do. I feel sad for these guys, but I also feel sad for the people hearing their false gospel. But it's not just them. There's people, there's, they're, they're, there's, there's guys and they're just trying to build their tabernacles, some worldly tabernacles. And, you know, Christ didn't tell us to big, tell us to build, big build fancy buildings. You know, that's not what our should, money should be going to. Our money should be going to the, the first of all, to help the saints and, and, and people in need within our own congregations. And then second of all, it should go out to the world to bring people to Christ. So that's where the money should be going. And, you know, we waste so much money in the United States of America. I mean, we're just building buildings and paying high salaries and things like that. And, um, you know, the true servants of God, you know, oftentimes are neglected. The true servants of God... They don't get paid much hardly anything a lot of times because people don't recognize the truth. They, they have itching ears and they heaping un, unto themselves teachers. Oh, just tell me an easy gospel so I can, you know, so I can still sin and still love the world and pursue worldly things and amusements and don't don't make it too hard for me, you know. Well, I tell you, the true gospel, a true preacher will tell you a true gospel that it is hard and that you have to pick up your cross and follow Jesus. And Jesus warns in Revelation 2.20 of the woman Jezebel that teaches God's servant to, to commit sexual immorality and idolatry. And, you know, there, this Jezebel spirit is at work in the church teaching this thing. It's also called the spirit of Balaam, you know, in the same chapter, you know, and the Nicolaitans. And, the you know, Nicholas was one of the, the, the deacons that supposedly gave up his wife to for sexual immorality. And so, you know, it's, it, and that's what it is when you're, when you love the world and material things of this world, it's, it's called spiritual unfaithfulness to God, and, and it's like fornication or sexual immorality. Very much like that. So the conclusion of this is to, to, to seek out true doctrine. Seek out what the, what the doctrine of the apostles and Jesus Christ was. Don't, you know, don't rely on, on your preacher alone or your pastor to teach you the truth. Find out what it says in the Bible. Read the Bible for itself and take it for what it says. This is the teachings of Jesus Christ our Lord and the apostles. And I'm, you know, in these videos, I'm I'm trying to bring this out to, to people because there, there has been a, a you know a false teaching, a false doctrinal system in the church for hundreds of years, and it's really corrupted the Word of God to a large degree. It's a, it's it's really another gospel. It's a gospel that that is foreign to what the apostles taught. It's a gospel that was it, it's closer to the to Gnosticism than it really is to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Now I realize in the midst of that, there's a lot of people that believe this doctrinal system in ignorance, you know. And I and I and I know that what the Scripture says that we love one another. It's important. Don't go rejecting people and saying, "Ah, you're off on, on your doctrine." Be patient. Let's be patient with each other and love one another. Because some of us have more knowledge than others do, and if you have more knowledge than others, then, you know, don't be judgmental in rejecting them. But remember, the doctrine of Christ is to love one another. So, you know, you may see some, some problems, you know, some deficiencies in some Christians, but if their heart is to love Jesus, then, then your obligation is to love them in spite of their, 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 um, their, their, their uh, falling short, I would, would call it. But then, on the other hand, there's the faults. The faults we must reject. And, and judge and 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 you know that's one of the big problems in the churches today is that the pastors and the, and the elders are not exercising moral discipline you know you need to purge out the old leaven that the lump may be clean so you know, when you have people in your church who are hypocrites you, know, you got to deal with it like Jesus said he said you know you know if you see your brother sinning you you go reprimand him you know to go by yourself first and then with two witnesses and then if it doesn't then bring him for the church See, so that you may be a pure lump. Because when we're a pure lump, then we'll be a shining light and a testimony to the world around us. And when the world sees our love and our good works, that will be a powerful persuasion force to them. Because I tell you, the people in the world, they know what it's like to have disharmony in a group. You know, that's one reason why I'm glad in, in, in my business life that I didn't have to work in an office. Because all the office gossip was going around, this and that. I just, oh, it's terrible. But, uh, okay, folks, so let's uh, seek out from the Bible. Read your Bible every day. Read it a lot, not just a little bit. 
and let's see what did what did the, the, the apostles of Jesus Christ really teach us concerning his doctrine what did our Lord Jesus teach Matthew Mark Luke and John what are the things he taught am I doing those things see and then you'll know that truth the truth is the doctrine and the doctrine will set you free hallelujah so God bless you and uh, prosper you